So in preparation for the comic review, I purchased and watched the movie version of Future Shock. Since the comic was only 12 pages, I expected it to just be a tie-in prologue book. You know, something that takes place right before the events of the movie that provides extra backstory or something. But nope, it's an adaptation, one that makes very little sense when you actually watch the movie and see how much better a job they did there. Yeah, Future Shock is actually a surprisingly decent film. As I said in the review of the comic, it's kind of an anthology film, tying together three unrelated stories with the linking thread of the psychiatrist's office. Unlike the comic, the doctor is just well, a doctor at some high-class, high-tech psychiatry firm. He's not trying to take over people's minds or anything. I suspect that the comic was written with an earlier version of the script in mind, though they may have at least storyboarded some of these sequences, since the movie versions of them actually replicate how they look in the comic, or possibly the other way around. I don't know which of the two came first, though there is an eight-minute making-of documentary on the DVD where some of the producers are holding the comic, though they don't talk about it. The bizarre opening of the comic featuring the holographic or virtual reality stripper that switches genders and causes a guy's head to explode is not in the movie. Sort of. While it's not actually a part of the movie itself, it is included on the DVD in the special features, listed as unrated pre-credit sequence. It's actually even more ridiculous than the comic version, since the guy is a bigger doofus in the movie than his sequential art counterpart. Anyway, let's talk about the movie itself. The first vignette was written by and stars Vivian Schilling, the writer and actress from Soul Taker. Speaking of Soul Taker, when her character Jenny is driving home, she hears this news report. Mayor McMillan's speech at tonight's charity benefit was interrupted just minutes ago with the tragic news that the mayor's daughter, 22-year-old Natalie McMillan, and four others were involved in a drug-related one-car accident. It's a cute little reference to Soul Taker. Hell, if I didn't know this was all a dream, it does make you wonder if this takes place in the same universe as Soul Taker. Anyway, she's extremely paranoid about her life and the possibility of being murdered. What makes this one work so well is the dreamlike atmosphere and the use of wide-angle lenses to show a large, empty room except for her. It gives the impression that something is watching her, stalking her, but since she keeps having half dreams and hallucinations, you can't really be certain what's real and what isn't. Is it all in her mind, or are there really a bunch of wolves coming for her and preparing to kill her? If you've seen my comic review, you know the answer, and it's a good twist and works as a short film. However, I really wish that this had been the whole movie. She's not a bad actress, and the character of Jenny, while paranoid, isn't all that stupid. When she thinks something is outside, she prepares various kinds of weapons to protect herself, not just one, and she's always reacting like a normal human would. Well, except for one scene where she steps on some broken glass, and she apparently doesn't notice for a little while how badly she's bleeding. I just imagine she'd pick up on that a little bit sooner. However, that does kind of enhance the dreamlike atmosphere, making you wonder if she really did it at all. There are some genuinely scary moments here and there, with lots of suspense and the chaotic cuts here and there once again reinforce our inability to tell what's real and what isn't. There's also a scene where she's in bed watching the TV, and she not only briefly watches Return of the Living Dead, but also Howling 2, Stirbo Werewolf Bitch. I don't know the legality of that, since I don't know if the company that put out this movie also owned the rights to those movies, but it did make me kind of laugh for a bit. A few trivia notes revealed in the behind the scenes. While they did have wolves for a lot of the shots, when they needed to do some pickup shots later, the wolves didn't arrive. By chance, an actor was walking his two dark German shepherds at the time, and they used those for a lot of shots, which also helped the atmosphere as they were better able to blend into the shadows. It's like they say, art through adversity. By that same token, they found a house in Malibu that was perfect, filmed a lot of it there, but when they went back at another time to finish parts of it, the house had burned down in a wildfire. As such, they had to recreate some of the interiors on a soundstage. Well done, too. I couldn't tell the difference at all. 
But yeah, the Jenny stuff is the best part of the movie, and I wish it had been the whole movie, since the other two vignettes are weaker than it and not as scary or atmospheric. I also can't help but feel it was made a little bit before its time. Jenny is constantly listening to the news, which builds her fears and paranoias, and I can't help but feel it'd be an even stronger reflection on our society if it had come out right after 9-11, where people were constantly watching the news and getting riled up and fearful of the things we're reported. However, there are two other stories here. The second, about the roommate Vince, played by Bill Paxton, is probably the worst of the three because it feels out of place with the tone of the rest. Hell, for some reason, it's filmed in widescreen and presented that way, while the other two are full screen. The movie does actually explain his job as a technician at the morgue, but in fact the comic was superior in delving into his psychosis, where we saw him repeating the without order, there is chaos thing over and over. In the movie, it feels just like an afterthought. The guy is a complete weenie in the movie. His boss, I guess, they only establish who the hell this guy is in his final scene, just randomly comes into his office one time, messes up his stuff, and then leaves again without saying a word. And you're just left wondering, what the hell just happened? Who was that guy and why didn't he say anything? And yeah, he only talks in his last scene to proclaim that the weenie is fired and we learn that he needs a voice box to speak. Thanks for establishing that, movie! The Satan's slut thing is explained in the movie, too. It turns out the woman who had been with Bill Paxton had a tattoo that had the words written on her ass. And, of course, instead of ever going to the police with what he knows or suspects, he just flips out for no reason. And the cops just assume he's the murderer without any kind of evidence. And then I guess they went through his office and messed up the place? Weird. Hell, Bill Paxton is actually better here than in the comic. He wasn't already waiting in the weenie's house. He called first and showed up acting suspiciously. He even took the time to alter the advertisement to his liking. Yes, he's still some kind of weird douchebag, but he has a better imposing presence about him that would make you believe why the weenie is afraid of him. The weenie also steals the gun at the end instead of it just being implied that there wasn't a waiting period. The thing is about this vignette is that it feels like it would work better if it was a self-contained episode of Tales from the Crypt. The weirdness there kind of makes sense given the atmosphere, but in this it's just bizarre and frustrating to see this idiot flailing around. On top of that, they already spoiled that the device was causing everything in Jenny's vignette, so when we see this one, we know it's not real, so it kind of ruins any kind of point they were trying to make. The final vignette is more of a love story, and feels more solid in terms of its themes. The comic ruined it by condensing it down and not letting it really pace itself and establish things. His relationship with Paula is actually put forth a lot better, and we see this gradual build-up to his increasing worry about things that could kill him. It's really well put together in that regard. There's a really good scene where he's talking to his father about his fear of death, and the father almost pulls him out of his paranoia until they get a phone call about a relative who just died. Bad timing. I'll say this, this one has the funniest parts of the movie. Remember that plane crash bit from the comic? Well, in the movie, when he sees out that window... I didn't add that music. It is in the movie, and it's hilarious just how over-dramatized it is. Like the comic, it takes Paula to pull him out of his funk, and the silhouette sequences are much better handled, giving a kind of interesting reflection on what kind of things happen after you die. It's a good short film all in all. Albeit, I do have to wonder why his own experience with the hypnosis machine had its own book endings with the silhouettes. When he comes out of the virtual reality, hypnosis, whatever, he actually seems like a changed person. So this story actually had a point to it for his character. Unlike the comic, though, we don't have that scene where it turns out Jenny is having a session with Dr. Langdon. He just shows up for work, stares at the device, and then bam, credits. All in all, I do actually have to recommend this if you like somewhat weird films. Here's my question, though. Why in the hell is this called Future Shock? The only thing that I can guess is that it's about people who are shocked by the future? 
you know, fearful of what the future might bring? If that's the case, it's kind of a dumb title. But even then, it's already kind of a dumb title because it has nothing to do with being shocked and even less to do with the future. You know what would have actually been a great title for this? Paranoia. Yeah, 